think that anybody knows right now how to make the next generation of MMO. Like, what does an MMO look like nowadays? What do we do? There's nothing here for us. This old bloody gun. The throne lies empty. We're gonna die! There's nothing left! Brothers and sisters, hear me. You have traveled far. To have reached this place, you have survived great perils. While many of you made it here, others were not so lucky and fell for what you did not. You stopped along the way, perhaps relived old memories. And there was bliss in that, for a time. Until you realized it would never live up to what it used to be. Thus, with ragged clothes and shattered dogma, you made your way here, to the Hall of MMO Kings, seeking salvation. But like all who come here, you have found only a ruin and an empty throne. Who... who are you? I was once the keeper of this place. The caretaker of Hallowed Stone. For years I have waited and withered in silence, awaiting the day I would have a reason to uphold my oath. So I say... Damn! Waiting! Ignite the fire. Each of you cling to holy scripture that is different from those beside you, but you could not see, for the darkness was too great. In this church of MMO fans, when those doors opened, you all cried out, believing you spoke in a unified voice. But in reality, it was a cacophony of indiscernible pleas. At best, impossible to understand by developers who care at worst, a ripe target for the corporate and the greedy. No more. Burn it away. Cast your scriptures into the fire. Kindle the flames. And join me as I write in the embers of your false gods the blueprint for the MMO that will ruin our lives. From direct voice communication with NPCs. He looks really impressive. Is that someone I can, like, go on an adventure with? That is one of the toughest warriors around. But I'm afraid he wouldn't be interested in teaming up with someone who just started being an adventurer. To city guards who have actual human-like intuition, unlike previous games. Farewell. May you rest in peace. The introduction of advanced artificial intelligence is going to revolutionize what used to be possible in video games. So it's time to think bigger. To create the MMO that will ruin our lives will require conceptualizations beyond the scope of what has ever existed in an MMO. But can we really visualize something that has never been done before? We can, but it involves creating a god. The developers of video games are the bridge that connects us, the players, to the worlds we so enjoy. In many ways, developers are akin to gods, and receive much the same kind of reverence, or scorn, as the gods of mythology once did. They create worlds, write the rules, and compete with other gods for the adoration of us, mere mortals. As games have increased in their scope and their complexity, so too have the gods increased in their innovation. Helldivers 2 having a developer, Joel, who directly interfaces with the community and controls the battle lines from behind the scenes, is a recent example and a brilliant step towards creating a more interactive game. Imagine an MMO that responds to player behavior in a similar fashion, in real time, moment to moment, day by day, with emergent gameplay. 
Imagine if the entire game world itself was monitored by a new kind of god, an AI. Not unlike Joel from Helldivers, but far more expansive in its scope. A kind of monitor fused directly into the foundations of the world. What if players were building a settlement far into undiscovered lands and began clear-cutting forests for construction projects and a valuable lumber trade? Perhaps the world monitor would begin to strike back and send an army of Ents to attack the settlement, angry that their forests are being harmed so extensively. A wizard should know better! How interesting would it be for those players to contemplate how to solve this problem? What are the consequences of their choices? If they choose to fight, and they win, perhaps the area starts to become sick, and the environment begins to slowly change into a gray and muddied landscape. If they choose to negotiate, the leaders of the settlement might get to speak with the Ent Lord. In exchange for stopping the deforestation, perhaps the Ents and the settlers enter into a powerful alliance, and the Ents become friendly NPCs in the area, protecting travelers and caravans from dark forces. What is most important in all of this is that player discussion and player action leads to immediate change in the world around them, with long-term consequences. In many ways, the world must feel truly alive with its own motivations that exist beyond the prior knowledge of the players. All of these examples are individually possible by traditional developers, but take a significant amount of time. A lag that has persistently separated players from the level of immersion they could experience in an MMO. It's not the fault of the developers, who work tirelessly to make their games as good as possible and to update them as quickly as possible. But such is the business of entertaining mortals, whose thirst for new adventure is quite simply insatiable. Putting aside the dramatic flair, I'm not advocating for human developers to not be involved in game making. On the contrary, I think the development hierarchy should look something like this. At the top, we have the human developers and their studio. They are the original creators of the game, whose role remains in many ways unchanged until the launch of the game, laying the groundwork. From art style to game mechanics to initial storyline, but while they may be all powerful, developers are not all knowing. They cannot easily track the movement and data of every player and every NPC, or the harvest of every resource. The human mind is simply not meant to parse through and find meaning in that much data. Thus, the gods need a governor, a deity capable of collecting and sorting through the actions of millions of players 24-7, and through that data, creating emergent gameplay. This AI may even be programmed to create unique game assets to assist with an emerging storyline and implement them upon approval from the developers. In our Ant Conflict example, perhaps the Ant Lord is an NPC that didn't even exist in the game files before the conflict broke out. The AI created him, taking an Ant model and scaling it up slightly, maybe giving it a bigger beard, and providing him with unique motivations and dialogue, using him to create a unique storyline. There is even an argument to be had that there should be two AI governors, one representing good, working to maintain balance, honor, and life in the world, and one representing evil, working to sow chaos, cause cataclysm, and bring death. And beneath all this are the players, mortal in the scale of their power, but foundational to the unfolding events of the world. An MMO with no clear sides or factions, only that which the players create themselves, how interesting would it be for players to discover that, perhaps by performing consistently evil acts for a long time, the AI governor of evil might reward that player with a completely unique weapon because it recognizes that this player is serving its interests? How incredible would it be for legends to be born from sheer dedication to a cause, champions of life and death? Real players given unique abilities created by suggestions from the AI and tweaked by the developers. Now I want to go through a bunch of details that are critically important to an MMO that will ruin our lives. There's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right into it. First is user interface. Incredibly important. I would argue it's actually a player's first impression of a game. A good user interface is one that the player doesn't even notice. A bad one is one that the player spends 10 minutes changing the keybinds on before even playing the tutorial. Somehow Elden Ring is in both of these camps. I love how free of clutter the screen is when playing Elden Ring, and how information only appears when it is important in the moment, like when health is lost, 
or an item is used. But I also remember needing to check the controls several times when I first started in order to understand how to do certain things. So for our new game, I would advocate for a mixture of Elden Ring's clutter-free interface with a slightly simpler control scheme. Combat and warfare. Just Elden Ring. Are you picking up a theme here? All jokes aside, the combat in Elden Ring is nothing short of incredible. With pixel-perfect hitboxes that make for some truly epic moments, Elden Ring's combat is unmatched in the genre. Do I think that this perfectly translates to an MMO setting? No. But I do think Elden Ring combat ran so our MMO could sprint. And with a few modifications, this system could provide for an incredibly immersive and rewarding experience, particularly if we did away with all the rolling, and provided more options for blocking incoming attacks with shields, parry more easily with weapons, or just simpler dodges that don't have an entire battlefield of players looking like roly-polies. Speaking of battlefields, warfare should be a big part of this game. Players should be able to form guilds, those guilds should be able to fight each other over keystone territory points like fortresses and castles in order to govern zones in the game. I'm particularly excited about the work being done in this direction by Ashes of Creation. Not only does Ashes already boast a high battlefield player count, which is incredibly important, Ashes also promises to give weight to warfare by creating world-altering consequences as a result of these player conflicts. MMO players crave taking part in massive battles that result in a shifting political landscape. In the MMO that will ruin our lives, there would ideally be battles that contain several thousand players on both sides. And in an MMO of this scale, no expense should be spared to make this the reality. This leads perfectly into a brief look at player settlements. I also love what Ashes of Creation is doing here. I think the node system is a brilliant idea. I think allowing players to freely build in an MMO the way they do in survival games is just too prone to griefing and bad design. But Ashes of Creation bridges this gap perfectly. Dozens of pre-designated locations across the world that players can band together, gather resources, and grow a city. One that they control both politically and economically. Fostering local communities, each with their own unique identity and culture to rally behind, is extremely important for creating endgame content. Players love having a flag to rally behind, and a home, one they built with their own hands, to protect. This concept, if done correctly, will be critical to the long-term success of Ashes of Creation, and likewise, should be a foundational element to any world-class MMO. Now for what could be argued is the most important system to get right in an MMO, gear and power scaling. Getting this right is critical to the long-term health of the MMO, because it is the groundwork for the entire reward structure and the economy of the game. If done incorrectly, it results in the absolute mess that is modern-day World of Warcraft, with ridiculously inflated numbers and abilities that make the screen impossible to understand. This is the flaw of a vertical progression system, where new and more challenging endgame content is released periodically, rewarding players with gear more powerful than their last. This is just a vicious cycle, that does a number of incredibly harmful things to an MMO, like making old content completely obsolete, and making players who don't have as much time to play feel like they're increasingly left behind. So what alternative do I propose? Well, it's not Elden Ring. It's Minecraft. What? You see, Minecraft has had nearly the same progression system since its inception. There is a cap to how powerful a player can become compared to the world around them. The rest is up to individual players' skill and creative thinking. I'm going to keep using the Minecraft armor because it's easier, so just visualize this with me. Our MMO should have a fixed gear hierarchy that should never change over the lifetime of the game, with equipment ranging from common to uncommon, rare, epic, and finally legendary. This gear should be acquired through the combination of two important steps. First, the materials must be gathered in the open world and then crafted into weapons and armor by blacksmiths, tailors, and leather workers, etc. Then, a second vital component, a kind of magic essence, needs to be added to the weapon or armor by the players themselves. We can call this whatever we want, essence, energy, light, doesn't matter. This essence, which comes exclusively from killing monsters in the world, brings the weapon or piece of armor to its full potential as designed by the craftsman. So a rare sword crafted by a blacksmith that does 50 damage per swing would only do 25 damage per swing when not infused with essence. Higher level monsters and raid bosses will drop more powerful essence, which is the only kind that can effectively infuse higher level gear. Furthermore, gear that isn't infused with essence will degrade over time with use, and if not repaired by a craftsman, will eventually break. 
essence will also slowly evaporate over many days, even when you're offline. This creates an incredible feedback loop. Players who enjoy raiding dungeons and fighting monsters will be able to sell their excess essence on the open market because everyone wants it to play at their full strength. Players who enjoy gathering resources and crafting gear will find a steady and reliable market for their work because weapons and armor will regularly break or need repair. All of a sudden, just by replacing the outdated vertical progression system, we can have a vibrant and very real player-driven economy. Players who don't have as much time to play as some people do will now never feel left behind knowing that over time, they can work towards building a permanent kit of epic level gear. And on the flip side, players who can log on every day will still have plenty of reasons to keep playing, from new bosses and raids, to guild wars over valuable land, to searching for legendary spells, and I'll explain that in a second. There are so many more interesting ways to keep players engaged than to pull a slot machine once a week for equipment, or ultimately, pay real money for a chance at getting that gear. This also frees up an astronomical amount of time and resources for the developers. They don't have to worry about making hundreds of new sets of armor or weapons every year, and don't have to worry about balancing new higher level bosses against the new, more powerful gear. They can instead devote that time to creating unique game content, like progressing storylines or updating the world. This bleeds into our final topic, removing traditional class systems. I don't think that class-based systems are inherently a bad thing, but they run into a similar problem as vertical gear systems in MMOs, namely feature creep. As time goes on, players demand more and more new abilities to use in their classes, or even entirely new classes altogether. Not only is this increasingly difficult to develop and balance, it's also overwhelming to new players who are then too intimidated to play the game. The alternative I'd propose is somewhat of a mixture between what Ashes of Creation is making and you guessed it, Elden Ring. See, Ashes of Creation, while they are making a traditional class system, is massively expanding upon it by allowing players to combine two different classes to create up to 64 unique character archetypes. This is extremely cool, but I think down the road they're going to run into the problems I mentioned before, where players might demand more abilities, and I know for a fact that 64 unique classes is going to require a lot of attention. Elden Ring, on the other hand, uses a stat allocation system. As the player levels up, they choose where to spend their talent points. Increasing strength lets you hit harder, and increasing intelligence lets you smart harder. So where do your special abilities come from? Well, in a traditional MMO, they are just given to you when you level up. But in Elden Ring, you have to find them? Here's what I'm suggesting. I think that in the MMO that will ruin our lives, we could do way better than the outdated techniques first developed in the early 2000s. What if you took all the spells and abilities that are normally developed for a class-based MMO, threw away the classes, and then ranked these abilities in the same way our weapons and armor are ranked, from common all the way through legendary? The vast majority of these spells and abilities would be in common, uncommon, and rare categories, with a powerful and elite few in the epic category, and only a handful in the legendary section. Common spells would already be known to the entire player base. All you need to access them, like all abilities, is the right amount of points in a specific stat. So if you want to cast Fireball, it would potentially require 8 points into Intellect, but if you only have 4 points in Intellect and you're at level 2, you might need to hit level 3 or level 4 before you can use that spell. So there's theoretically no rules as to what spells you can or cannot have access to. You could have as many different abilities at lower power as you like, or focus your points to delve deep into a specific archetype. Classes would then be entirely defined by the player base, and even players who fall into certain archetypes like fire mages or paladins would all be somewhat unique from one another, choosing different spells to suit their playstyles, like real adventurers in a fantasy world. Now things get really exciting. Uncommon spells and abilities, while not already known to players, can be easily found for purchase at magic stores or training halls for a small cost just like in WoW. Rare spells, though, begin to become more difficult to find. Some might even be found at these vendors for a high price or as a reward for a difficult quest. Others, however, can only be found by killing certain rare enemies or by exploring the open world and solving puzzles or rituals. Epic level spells won't even be available for purchase anywhere. These spells will be exclusively found by defeating raid bosses or completing extremely difficult quests or by unraveling the mysteries of the world itself. 
Finally, legendary spells, like their legendary weapon counterparts, should be awarded by an incredibly complex set of requirements that are hidden to the player base in a way that is hopefully impossible to reverse engineer. Or should be rewarded to players who are among the first to defeat a limited time apocalypse level raid boss. This change to classes does two incredibly important things. First, it gives players a profound sense of learning and accomplishment as they go on their journey to max level. Imagine how rewarding it would feel for a player to learn a powerful new spell because they followed their instincts and pursued a hidden questline. Rewarding player progress with new abilities to add to their arsenal is proven to be one of the most exciting and immersive ways to keep a player engaged as they play the game. The second, and arguably more important element, is that it creates an incredibly unique endgame loop, where players are valued not necessarily for the gear they possess or the gear they bought, but for the spells and abilities they've learned along the way, and by the word of mouth reputation of their skill. There's honestly just so much more that should be covered in an MMO of this scale, I couldn't possibly fit it into one video. I know there's all sorts of caveats and what ifs that I didn't cover, and I certainly didn't talk about the price tag something as innovative as this would come with. This video was less about the practicality of making something on the scale, but rather about the true next leap in MMO game design. As I showed at the start of this video, Asmongold recently said that nobody really knows what the next generation of MMOs is gonna look like. But the truth is, we kinda do. We all do, and simultaneously we don't. As a mass of consumers, we can't seem to agree on the details, and yet here we all are, in the hall of MMO kings, refugees. Because while we don't know what the future of MMOs will really look like, many of us agree that the present MMO situation just ain't it. Thanks for watching, guys. This video was a massive undertaking. So if you enjoyed and you know somebody else who might like this kind of content, I'd be incredibly grateful if you shared it around. Word of mouth is really the only way a tiny channel like mine can grow. And of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. What did I miss? What other innovations do you think need to be made to the MMO space? Thanks again, everyone. I'll see you soon.